So after that, I, I was stand corrected. And now I always, always refer to 1995 as my favorite eclipse. It took your breath for a minute. Yeah, I was like, oh and then I was like, God. oh my God, this is all happening. And before I knew it, it was over, it was sad. This is crazy. This is so nuts. I'm Letitia Ferrer. And I'm Chris Alexander. And this is Totality Talks, the Solar Eclipse podcast. It just took my breath away, the whole thing. It's really cool that you can see the corona and you see the sun kind of spewing out from behind the moon. It literally took our breath away. A lot of people said overrated, but that was like Not one overrated. of the coolest things I've ever seen. Not overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Totality Talks, where we take the deep dive into the true awe of totality. Today, we are honored, amazed, and delighted to have a premier expert on eclipses, retired NASA Goddard Space Flight Center astrophysicist Fred Espinak. Known as Mr. Eclipse, Fred has authored over 20 books related to eclipse prediction, eclipse observation, and eclipse photography. He's traveled to all seven continents to observe total eclipses of the sun and witnessed 30 total solar eclipses. 11 annular solar eclipses, and 9 partial solar eclipses. He spent almost an hour and a half inside the umbral shadow. His famous quote, Before you die, you owe it to yourself to experience a total solar eclipse, is repeated by umbrophiles everywhere when explaining eclipses to casual observers. Today, we chat and listen to Fred's tales from the road and route to chasing totality. So, Fred, I do want to send you a little gift for doing this, but I'm not sure you want another Total Solar Eclipse T-shirt, or do you? (laughs) I probably have a a lifetime supply. Thank you. (laughs) Well, I'll think of something. I'm I'm actually trying to clear out stuff now. (laughs) I know. Not accumulate more. Yeah, I I understand. (laughs) I'll I'll think of something. I'll think of something. Because we really appreciate your graciousness to do this for us. Well, I haven't done it yet, so you may <laughs> regret it. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. I've seen you do talks. You you are fantastic. I want to say welcome, Fred Espinak, the father to me of the current travel industry for solar eclipses, because he was the one that was able to put all the information out there of where can we go. I have been planning my life around his information since 1998. And I believe I told you that in the 2005 trip what we took on the that little boat that kind of went way too back and yeah, forth. Yeah, the, the legend. The legend. <laughs> yeah. But that was one of those eclipses where you really had to try hard to get to. It was hard to get to. And it was a narrow path. A narrow path, 30, only 30 eclipse. seconds. 30 seconds. What's that? It was only a 30-second eclipse. That's right. And it was it was annular at the ends. Yes. Yes. Oh, so it was a hybrid? Yeah. It was a hybrid. Yep. And then I was, I went and looked up when your first eclipse was, chat GPT told me. Um, It was in 1970? That's correct. My first total eclipse. Your first total eclipse. And I just realized, and when I looked it up, I realized that you have an anniversary coming up, an eclipse anniversary. It'll be the fourth Eclipse of Saros 139, which is the same as the Saros, which is the same Saros of your first one. Yeah, that, that's right. That's uh, I guess that's a, a mile milestone of some sort. It's a big milestone. I'm looking forward to my fourth one. You've been look look. You've been chasing eclipses for 54 years. Is that how the math works out? Yeah, just just yeah. It's 53, 54 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. I'm sorry. I'm 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 thrilled for you because I'm I'm hoping to get that far. Well, my my first one really was was a partial eclipse, and that was back in 1963. <clears throat> and uh, I was just a kid then, an amateur astronomer, and I had a telescope, and I knew about this eclipse that was taking place on the east coast of uh, the U.S. I didn't know anything about total eclipses. I'd never seen an eclipse, but I knew 
that um, it would be a partial eclipse visible from um, my, uh, I was spending part of the summer at my uh, grandparents' home in uh, Long Island, New York. And um, I didn't have a telescope with me, but, um, and I didn't even have a solar filter, but we had a cloudy day and I was looking at the reflections in mud puddles. Ooh. And I could see some of the partial phases through some of the, between the clouds and, and the reflections off the mud puddles. And it got me interested in eclipses with that event. And I think shortly after that, I found out that it was also a total eclipse, but a couple hundred miles or four or 500 miles north of me up through Maine. Right. And that started me getting more interested in eclipses to find out, well, when, when can I get a chance to see a total eclipse? And I had this little golden book of astronomy um, that had constellations and planets and inf information, you know, a kid's book. <clears throat> but it had a map of upcoming total eclipses in it, a world map. And it showed that there was a total eclipse going through the eastern United States in 1970. So that was, you know, seven years in the future at that point. And I said, well, I've got to see this. This is a, a once in a lifetime chance to see a total eclipse because it's going to be only a few hundred miles away. Yes. So fast forward to 1970, I had <clears throat> just gotten my driver's license. I was How old were you school. then? At that point, um, 18. Okay. And um, convinced my parents to let me um, take the car, uh, the family car, and drive south to the eclipse path. I was in New York, and, and the eclipse path went through. Um, the closest point for me was, was sort of um, North Carolina and Virginia. And I drove down to, to North Carolina, which was a 600-mile drive, um, unchaperoned, unescorted, uh, just a, a, a school friend with me. And he didn't have a driver's license, so I had to do all the driving. And I'd never driven a car for 600 miles before, so that was quite an experience. I'm surprised we made it back alive. A first for, but, every, um, for everything. We drove down to North Carolina and just, I had a, a, a map, um, um, an automobile map from a gas station that I had plotted the eclipse path on. And uh, we drove, drove down to North Carolina and put, put ourselves in the middle of the eclipse path, found a motel right there. On eclipse morning, the field behind the motel uh, looked like an astronomy convention. There were <laughs> telescopes all over the place. Everybody was there at that motel for the eclipse. Wow. So that was That was fantastic. The weather was good. We set up. Uh, managed to, to see a wonderful total eclipse. And as soon as it was, as it was over, I knew uh, this can't be a once in a lifetime event. I've got to see another one of these. <laughs> so I was, I was hooked right away. Good. <clears throat> and I understand uh, that. The next one was in um, two years into the future. Then that was in, uh, in uh, Eastern Canada. And the closest point for me was was in um, the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec. And by that time, I was in college, and I got uh, one of my college professors interested in it. And the two of us drove up to, to the Gaspé Peninsula to try to see the eclipse from there. But we were clouded out. Uh, Bad weather. Yep. I said, well, nuts. That's, that's the two really, really nearby eclipses in, in North America to see. But what about that eclipse coming up in Africa in 2073? So I started expanding my horizons of where oh, I could 19, go for an eclipse. It would have been 1973. 73, I'm sorry. Yeah, 73. Yeah. 1973. <clears throat> and uh, ended up join, joining a group out of New Jersey, a group of amateurs, uh, that had organized a trip with uh, Roger Tuthill, who did a lot of eclipse expeditions in the early years. He was uh, okay. associated with, with this, an astronomy group in uh, New Jersey, Cranford Astronomers, I think. And he organized a group, and he brought, I think, over 200 people, wow. uh, 200 amateur astronomers, wow. uh, mostly amateur astronomers, to the Sahara Desert in Mauritania. Wow. So that was really my first big international 
adventures. Sorry, Canada, that doesn't really count going up to the Gaspé Peninsula. That was yeah. that was hardly exotic, like 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 flying flying into Senegal and just I remember stepping off the plane, just the smells and the the aromas and just the ambiance of the whole place was was exotic and different. Right. Uh, that is and, one uh, of the- that was that was really the start of of a lifeline a lo- lifelong um, obsession, I guess, of, of uh, trying to see every total eclipse I could. I haven't gotten to every one, but I've gotten to most of them. Yeah. How many are you up to now? Um, the last one um, was this past April, and that was number thirty. Okay. In terms of totals, I'm ten behind you. What's that? I'm 10 behind oh, you. 10 behind I'm, up to tw- I'm up to 20. <clears throat> but I love what you said about after seeing your first one, you said this is not going to be a, a, a once in a lifetime thing. My first question was when and where's the next one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, the one I didn't get, I didn't get it to the next one until 1998 in Aruba. I saw my first one in 91. And back then okay. it was Mexico. And like you said, I, I went to Mexico with even without even a passport. I'd use my driver's license back then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can't do that anymore no no the other thing i wanted to ask you was how did you and sean mayus get together to do that giant compendium well i had um i guess in the, my early years of, of um uh studying eclipses he had the, the go-to book of of where and when is his uh, famous uh, canon of solar eclipses which he published I think in the mid '60s. Okay, so he published. And I managed his in, to get. What, the 60s? Uh, I, I managed to to borrow it from our college library in the early '70s, and Xerox a whole bunch of pages, and got interested in um, how to calculate eclipses, and he gave some some basic uh, the starting points for some of the some of the um, uh, equations needed, and some of the uh, uh, information about the moon's orbit and the sun's position in the sky to actually do some uh, preliminary uh, calculations for eclipse paths. And I was also just starting to study computer programming. So these two you know, were, were a marriage uh, made in heaven uh, to use the two of them together and, and start writing eclipse software. So that was probably, that was probably in the, in the, uh, the early 70s. That was back okay. in the days when if you wrote a some kind of a, a program, um, back then I was I was using Fortran. Okay, I was gonna ask you which which one it was, <laughs> Fortran or Pascal. And these days I, I use I'm still using Fortran and Pascal. Really? Yeah. Um, the Pascal I've got to run on a on a an, a a very old computer that I nurse along. I've got a, a backup computer in case it dies. <laughs> Because the newer models don't support that particular compiler. And oh. I've got so much uh, software written for that. And I just don't have enough time left in this lifetime to rewrite all the software. Do we need <laughs> to find somebody for to go transfer it for you sometime? Make it a somebody's research project? Yeah, that, that'd be great. I don't know who to turn to for that. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to start asking around. There were some. There are some very enthusiastic young people at the last solar eclipse conference that mm. Chris and I attended. And they said, "Yes, we're going to be the people that go ahead." To, to get back to your your question, I mean, I, I, I my first inspiration for eclipse predictions was Jean Mayos, and I got a couple of his books through the seventies and eighties, and um, in in the mid nineties, um, there was uh, preparations for um, a total eclipse going through. Um, Europe in 1999. Yes. And I was involved with uh, an international planning community, uh, a planning committee of scientists um, throughout Europe and, and uh, the U.S. Um, and we met in, I think, uh, in Bucharest uh, to have a, a, a discussion on, on upcoming plans for, for that particular eclipse. And while I was there in Europe, I, I had a chance to, to uh, meet up with, with Jean uh, at his home, and we had some good discussions, and we continued our um, uh, correspondence over the, the years. And I always had it in the back of my mind, it would be great to have some kind of a collaborative a- effort together. 
and he had s such great software for computing the positions of the of the moon and sun for Eclipse software, but he hadn't done an awful lot of the the mapping graphics that I had done. Um, now my map ma my mapping graphics is is pretty simple if you compare it to somebody who's a cartographer like uh, like um, um, Mike uh, Mike uh, Zeller. Uh, he does spectacular stuff, but back in these days, that, that, was, that was far in the future, that kind of software. Yes. So I, I was still do, doing some very simple uh, mapping software, and there was nothing else like that around. And I talked to, to Jean about putting out a new Canon with revised maps with much more detail in them. And that was the start of it back, uh, back in uh, around 2005 or so. And I think we got it published in 2006 or 2007 after okay. a lot of work. It, it, I'm sure it was a lot of work, but it is, it is the go-to, it is the Bible for, for solar eclipse chasers. Thank you. Zyler's work is built on top of it. Xavier's work is built on top of it. Time and date is using that information for their maps. Everybody is build, built on top of it. So you, are, you, you and Sean's work has just been the foundation for everything of, of all of that. And I think it's wonderful. I really and then we're, we're, we're basing a lot of our stuff on, on the mathematics that was developed in, in um, the, uh, 19th, the 20th century, 19th to 20th century. So uh, we didn't write any of the equations. We just applied them to uh, using the new tool, the, co the digital computer, to simplify and, and, and speed up the computations. Totality Talks is sponsored by American Paperware. It's paper that you wear. In 2017, they became a producer of safe ISO 12312-2 compliant glasses for solar observation. They've expanded their product line to include paper frame sunglasses with optically clear and thin filled sunglass lenses. A great promotional platform for your logo, concept, or artwork to make a lasting impression. Use their Solar Eclipse Design Studio app to create your own custom glasses. American Paperware at ampaperware.com. Click the link down below. So, do you know who did those first calculations back then, in the 19th century? Uh, yeah, uh, Theodore Opelzer uh, okay. published a, a canon of, of eclipses back 1887, I want to say. That's probably the oldest major um, canon of eclipses. And back in those days, they had computers, but the computers were people. Yes. Graduate students. He had he had, you know, a huge numbers of people that would do all these calculations longhand, and he would have one person doing the calculations, someone else to double check them and then compare and make sure they got the right answers. So he published this marvelous canon, uh, and I think in 87, 1887, that uh, was was uh, incredible in its day. If we compare it to results these days. Uh, he only used three points to plot an eclipse path. So the, the end points and the middle point. So when you look at the details of the eclipse path, sometimes they don't follow uh, the actual path of the eclipse. There okay. may be, be displacements of hundreds of miles. And he didn't pl plot, plot things like the width of the path. He only plotted the central line. Okay. But in its day, it was, it was miraculous. It yep. was the start of, of that sort of thing. Yeah, it would be. It would have been. It would have been. I'll look it up. Uh, to, um, you're able to find a lot of books like that now on the Google Books and have them reprinted. Yeah, this was this book was um, Upelzer's book was re, 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 pu published, reprinted by Dover Books in the 1960s, and sometimes you can find a copy of it on eBay. Okay, I'll take a look. I'm gonna look for it because that sounds like a nice collector's item. Yeah, for me. Yeah, at least for me. Well, I was going through the the thousand year canon of eclipses and trying to go back to find out when the last annular eclipse was over our property, oh. and I got back to fifteen hundred, and I'm like, oh, now I need the five thousand year canon. <laughs> so I love that I got to upgrade. the The idea. Let me just say that the idea for the thousand year canon 
I mean, I, I've done, I've done the, the, the 5,000 year cannon while I was working for NASA. Um, and I retired in 2009 and, uh, after, after a, a few years, I kept referring to the, the, the 5,000 year cannon when I, when I wanted to look up things, but invariably I was always looking at looking up stuff that was within a couple hundred years of right now. I, I normally didn't really need all 5,000 years. I just wanted a few, you know, a thousand years centered on today uh, and with slightly bigger maps. So that, that was the idea of doing the, the, the thousand year cannon. Uh, it's got larger maps. It's a smaller volume. It's easier to haul around. And it answered nine out of 10 of my questions whenever something came up. And it was my first experiment in actually self-publishing. Because now oh, it was. I wasn't publishing okay. through NASA anymore. So I had to learn the hurdles of, of doing that myself and what options were out there to self-publish and ended up getting it um, done through publish on demand through through Amazon. Uh, back then, it was the, uh, uh, a sister company of Amazon called Create Space. That's sort of been merged into Amazon now. And now it's called Kindle Direct Publishing. But it's the same sort of thing. I give them a manuscript and they publish the books as people order the books. Right. So there's no inventory. That oh, was one wow. of the things I, I didn't want to be involved with. I didn't want to be involved with uh, what uh, Michael Zeiler calls uh, product fulfillment, which means you have a basement or a garage filled with maps and books. And every time someone orders something, somebody has got to get the book, put it in an envelope, weigh it, put the postage on it, and send it off to the post office. I didn't want to do that. I believe that's Patty. Polly. 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 Yeah. Thank you. So his wife Polly is a, that person. Yeah, she's she's that person. Yeah, she's that person. Yeah, she's the, I, and she's I, the man I understand manager. it. Well, my wife said no, no way. <laughs> she's a wise woman. Yeah, she didn't want anything to do that. So Pat's, this, Pat's this thing with, with Amazon was perfect because I I I, I could. All I had to do was concentrate on what I wanted to do, which was write and publish the books. Yes. And Amazon took care of everything else. And you've published how many now? Like 10? Because you've done the Road oh, Atlas. Boy. 2017, you've done it's, you know, books it, in it, other countries. I, I don't know exactly how to count them because a lot of the books I have, black, uh, bl both a black and white and a color version. And I've got, uh, I've got at least uh, 20 or 25 books published through Amazon. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I've got my first one out there now, but I'm about to do the update. So it'll be out. And updating out is nice because you just I know. submit you, you submit the manuscript, wait a day or two, they make sure you didn't make any big mistakes, and then you get an email that says, Okay, it's online. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and spring for the better printing this time. I was kind of disappointed on because I went for the lower end printing. I, I'm gonna have to do the high end. Yeah. Uh -huh this time it makes a difference i know your print your books come out very very nice so since we're talking about the book did you come up with and innovate yourself the, the all the information that's on every single image of each eclipse that's in the book is, is, did you take something from other predictors in the past and then put together that particular bit of information with the maps by by and large the information that are on those maps were my, my first inspiration for that was, was um, back when I was still with NASA back in the 1980s, um, probably my first eclipse book was the 50-year canon of solar eclipses. Okay, so you did the 50-year with that NASA first. Okay. That was at NASA first. And um, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to present one page with one global map of, of the Earth with an eclipse path that showed the northern and southern limits, showed where the 20%, 40%, 60%, percent, 80% partial eclipses were, some information about the position of the moon and the sun, the duration of the eclipse, information like that. That was all designed from that 50-year canon. Um, and uh, everything that I've done since then is, is derivative from that first original 50 year canon. And certainly with a thousand year canon, you can't include as much information because the maps are much smaller. Yeah. 
So you've got to call just the, the, the most important bits of information to go with each one of those maps, like the duration of totality or annularity. I'm going to ask the photography one because this is the one I'm bad at. And Chris is getting much, Chris is much better than I'm. Or you, why don't you ask this one? Because I'm the one that's like, oh, I'm going to go watch it. Here, you go take the pictures. <laughs> so over the years, I imagine at some point you made the migration from film over to digital. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And so how and, and when did that happen? Well, I was, I was ready to change, but the, I had to wait for the, the technology to catch up to what I wanted to do. I mean, the first, the first digital cameras that, that came out in the, in, in the 90s, it, it, they weren't single-lens reflex cameras. They were, they were point and shoots. They had a fixed lens. I needed something you could take the lens off, just like an, a single-lens reflex camera. And those, well, my first, my first real Eclipse camera was the Nikon D100. And I think that came out in 2000, I think in 2003. Okay. And uh, this was something I could, you know, it looked like a single lens reflex camera. I could take the lens off it, attach it to a, a telephoto lens or more importantly, a telescope. Um, but it only had six megapixels. In its day, that was, that was enormous. That was it was enormous. So that was, that was sort of the, 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 uh, the point where I started switching over to digital. And then, you know, within five or six years, you were suddenly up to 15, 20 megapixels very quickly. And even now you can do 4K video and then pull a decent picture out of the video. Right. Yeah. Which is what I love because I, I, I want to set it and forget it and just let it run. Or yeah. Like a watch. Yeah. So that that's what I'm doing. I, I aspire to do that. I, I'm getting closer and closer. <laughs> well, you've used Solar Eclipse Maestro, and I've watched you. I've watched several of your videos. I love the, there's one where you have it on from 2017, where you have it behind you, pointing up yes. to you and the eclipse, and right, then right. it's just a time lapse of you doing everything you can for the, you're running around just doing everything and then standing yeah. there watching the eclipse. That's right. Yeah. And what yeah, what yeah. kind of camera did you use for that, for that lapse, for that time lapse? The time lapse, that was a, that was a GoPro. Okay. Yeah. Oh, really? That was not, yeah. it came out just real a little well GoPro. GoPro. That's awesome. At the 2017 eclipse, that, that, it went, it, it was a, it was a great experience. I'm not complaining, but for me, planning it was a technological nightmare. Because really? I was running uh, against my better judgment, especially now in hindsight, I I was running and set up seventeen cameras. <laughs> what? Seventeen? Yeah, that was that was insane. Most of the, most of them worked. One, I think what? one of them I I had the sun actually out of the frame. What <laughs> What was the goal of that? For 17. I want to do wide angles. I want to do telephotos. I want to do time lapse. I wanted to shoot video. I want to do everything. And the other thing was, this was a, normally uh, when I go to an eclipse, um, I'm flying on commercial airlines. Um, I'm not. I, I've ne never done an eclipse trip for NASA. All okay. my eclipse trips have all been on my nickel. Yes. Or on the nickel of the, the tour agency that's bringing me along as, as the Eclipse expert. Yes. And there's a good reason for that, because if I got involved with something with with uh, under the auspices of NASA, they would own the, the work that I do during the Eclipse, including the photographs. Ah. Wow. Ah, okay. And I didn't want any of that part of that. I wanted those photographs to be mine. And I, and I didn't want to write, write a proposal for it. I wanted to do what I want to do. Yep. But when, so, that was when you start. When did you start, Mr. Eclipse? Because that's where all you were showing all of your work. Yeah, that, that was you did that those, was those years. That was in the the mid nineties. Okay. And that was because uh, I started the NASA Eclipse website. You know, working for the federal government is funny. Um, back back in those days, the uh, the internet was the wild west. Um, I ostensibly got tagged in my department to learn HTM programming so that we could put up a web page for 
the uh, information about each scientist, each scientist in our department, a, fo- a photograph and a bio and a list of their publications. And I, that, yeah. that's what I, I started out with in my in learning how to put up a, a web page. Um, but back in those days, you could do this from a modest desktop computer in your office. Yeah. So I started the the NASA Eclipse website in my office. Wow. Without without government approval, without <laughs> I just I just started putting that stuff out. <laughs> there were no rules. I just started putting it out there. Here, let me put that up there. And after so you and had, after a couple so did, of years, did you yeah. actually? So you did you register NASA dot com or NASA? No, you didn't need to back in those days. Oh really? No. Yeah. Okay. You just set up the service and got you it. You just going. set up the service. There was software you could free software you put put on the, on the computer that that could service it. And you you created your 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 URL and you, and you ran with it. Oh my god! So That's you know, awesome. a number of years later, they say, "Hey, what, what's going on? You, you've got NASA's name on this stuff, and we've got some guidelines." By that time, they're starting to develop guidelines and stuff. <laughs> and you know, I've already been doing this for several years, and they didn't <laughs> like the idea that I was posting any kind of photographs with a copyright on it. Ah. Uh. It had to be all public domain. So that's when the, 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 my Eclipse photographs came off the NASA website, and that's when I had to create an, a private website, Mr. Eclipse, just to showcase Eclipse photography. Okay. Okay, because <clears throat> before you were doing it on the NASA website. Yeah. With your own copyright on them. Okay. Right. All yeah. right. Like you Working said, it was a wild government. test right back then. Nobody knew what was gonna, how big that was going to be back then. And I wish no, I... No, no, no. Yeah. So now you're running Eclipse. Hold on a minute. I'll, I'll help It's you. not Mr. Eclipse anymore. The website that basically has taken over for the, the my original NASA Eclipse homepage is EclipseWise.com. EclipseWise, that's right. <clears throat> I ran the NASA page for, for a number of years after I rec- retired, but... Even just the the um, uh, the uh, the security measures needed for me to log on to the website and to upload changes to the pages. Um, I had a, a special key fob with a rotating number on it that changed. I had to use as part of the password. And then every time I tried to log in, some other protocol had had changed on the website. So now I had to spend half of my day talking to some a security specialist in Goddard to get approval so that I could upload the latest changes. And I would only do this maybe once or twice a year. And every yeah. time I wanted to upload some changes, I had to go through the same rigmarole because something else had changed. And now I had to talk to somebody else. Well, they were at a meeting. I couldn't talk to them right now. I had to leave a message and then go back and forth. And it would take me a day or two before I could upload the new changes. And I, I finally stuff, just gave up. I said, "I, it's easier to do this just on my own website. And I, I started yeah. EclipseWise.com. Yeah, well, because I, I, I think you were supporting that NASA site, like, after you retired. Yeah, yeah. for uh, Totally gratis. <laughs> <laughs> totally gratis. Oh, yeah. Thank you, for, thank you for your work for the government there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I know sure. it, it really has it. Now they're just pointing everybody over to the new site, which has got videos and lots of other stuff, but it doesn't have any of the just real numbery details. No. Which now we have to go to Eclipse Wise for that. And they won't even let me say an updated version is go to Eclipse Wise because that's a private website. <laughs> ah. So I wonder how they feel I wonder how they feel about the fact that I can't even go to the I can't even go to the NASA site and look at the map because it's always down. So yeah. I end up going to Xavier's site for the for the yeah. Google interactive map. Well I've got Google interactive maps on Eclipse Wise too. Okay. I'll start going back over I'll there have too. To send you a link to the twenty twenty four Eclipse. Good. Can I embed it in my... I'm trying to... Get... I don't think you can. Okay. I'm just pointing... Right now, I'm just pointing everybody yeah. to other maps. Yeah. Because it's so... The good thing about the interactive maps, like what's on Eclipse Wise, is the fact that people can drill down and really pick out their spot. Oh, yeah. You can zoom in themselves. and click on any place on the map and get your Eclipse times for that location. The time, get your eclipse times, and you know, then you go over to 
to go look at the weather and see what you're going to where you want to go and have right. two or three sites done. It right. just makes, I mean, the planning for eclipses now is so much easier to do your own thing. Absolutely. Own I mean, back back in the seventies, you you relied on the U.S. Naval Observatory published a circular for each upcoming eclipse. That had, oh, they did it then. That had detailed maps. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, they did that in in the, in the they started that and then I think they first one went back into the sixties. And they'd do one for each major total eclipse. Occasionally they do an, an annular eclipse. And they were doing it through around nineteen ninety one or so. The the uh, Naval Observatory got budget cut cutbacks and they n- could no longer fund a department to publish their eclipse circulars. So someone at the Naval Observatory contacted me because I'd been publishing articles on on eclipse uh, uh, calculations and maps, short articles very often in the Royal Astronomical Society uh, journal. And um, they asked me if I was interested in in, uh, providing a similar service for the uh, astronomical community. And I was interested. Uh, I had to, uh, fortunately, my my um, uh, division uh, head, uh, my supervisor, uh, gave me the green light as long as it didn't impact any of my other work at Goddard. So I was doing this on the side. Uh, and I started doing the, the NASA Eclipse Bulletins. Zero funding. Uh, I, I had to time it so that I could only publish these things at the end of the year when they had an end of year money that was going to be rolled back to headquarters uh-huh. was use or lose. Yes. And I would beg, borrow and steal to find publishing money. So I could get you know, two or 3000 of these things to print up and then have mailed out. And for a while I would have for, for a couple of months, I would have uh, six or eight foot tall stacks of books in my office um, <laughs> that I was mailing out to get out of my office and send around. And you world. were mailing them. You were yeah. mailing them. Yeah. You were labeling them and mailing them. Now, were yeah. people subscribing to them or just well, ordering, I, sending a letter sure, and ordering shortly, them? Shortly after I started doing that, I developed a mailing list. Okay. So then I would I would actually print out the labels on the, the, the sticky labels and bring those over to the, the, the um, mail department at Goddard. And when the books were printed, um, they would be sent to the mailing office first. They would take their cut if I gave them a thousand labels, they would take a thousand of the books and mail those for me. But then the other thousand books would be delivered to my office. And I would, I would mail those out one at a time as someone off or wanted to order an eclipse bulletin. Oh yeah. Think people think, Oh, it's the federal government. He's got, he's got buckets of money. He's got a big staff doing it. No, this was a one man operation. That sounds like product fulfillment. This is yeah, why this, you don't yeah, want to do product fulfillment. This is all a labor of love, you know? <laughs> And as long as it didn't impact my other work. Totality Talks is brought to you by TexasEclipses.com, where you can get the book, Texas Solar Eclipses. Learn about solar eclipse safety, the total solar eclipse in Texas of 1878, other recent total solar eclipses, how technology influences our experience, and citizen eclipse science then and now. That's texaseclipses.com. Click the link down below. Okay, so the 2017 and the 2024 are bringing in a new crop crop of umbra files. Chris and I met some of them at the the solar eclipse conference this last year. October, September. End of September, yeah. So what would you recommend to young people who see the 2017 and 2024 and go, this is for me. How do you make a job out of it? How do you get into research? There's not a lot of jobs involved in in, <laughs> in this line of, of, of work. The, the closest thing you can get to is, is, um, is get going into um, solar physics. But, you know, there's there's those 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 scary words physics, mathematics, calculus, lots of it. You got to be good at math. 
And you've got to have both a passion for it and a natural talent for it uh, going into the, into the physical sciences. And I, I have found going into the sciences has been a, a circuitous road. Um, you may plan to go from one point to someplace else, but the road has lots of twists and turns and, and who you meet at a certain point. And I never planned on ending, ending up being at, at, at the NASA Goddard for, for 30 years. I started out at the University of Arizona, but to make a long story short, things didn't work out that way. Okay. So it's it's hard to make a, it, it, it you know, what's that saying? Man plans and God laughs. Yes. Something like that. Yes. It's great to have a plan. Just be prepared to change it when things don't work out the way you think they're going to go and go with the flow sometimes. You have to. You have to. I mean, so make, not- make the most of, you know, what, what, what you're dealt. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I had no plans on, on, on doing something uh, with the, uh, NASA originally, but uh, that was that was uh, the, the, the past path of least resistance when I was getting out of school and, and looking for some astronomy-related job. Because this was also in the um, mid-70s. Um, so the Apollo programs were already winding down. Yeah. Uh, funding for, for science and astronomy were... We're, we're being cut back. Most jobs in, in astronomy these days, and we're even in those days, basically were for professors at universities. And the problem with those jobs is the only time a new job opens up is when somebody dies. Yes. Uh, so, and you, you look at the, the age distribution. I mean, I remember them showing me a graph in, in, in grad school, the age distribution of uh, the astronomical community, and they are all like the peak. The, the the median age was like five years older than me. <laughs> so I had to have all of them die, you know, yeah. or some of them <laughs> die to <laughs> open up a job for me. So I had to look elsewhere. <laughs> you only got oh, five man. years left, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 challenging. You're saying you you have the physics and. You know, all the math that's involved, but how do we get people that are perhaps maybe intimidated by that to just be an observer and get them into the path? Because that's what it seems like, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to do here is to encourage more people to get into the path of totality. And they think it's 99 percent or I've got 96 <laughs> percent. I'll see it. <laughs> I think I think the best the best thing I have seen in years is uh, I'm going to toot somebody else's horn here. Um, David Barron is, is an American yes. science writer. Um, he's written, uh, he wrote a, a great book, um, The American, I think The Great American, American Eclipse Amer- or The American yes. Eclipse about the, uh, the 1878 eclipse through Pikes Peak. Um, and he, he got a lot of notoriety for that. But he also has like a 10 or 15 minute, 15 minute TED talk on YouTube. And the title of it is something like, you really owe it to yourself to see a total eclipse once in your life. That's the first thing I tell somebody to watch who doesn't, who doesn't really know much about eclipses. And is it something that's worthwhile? And, and should they bother? And is 99% good enough? Sit down and watch that 10-minute, 15-minute uh, video of somebody who was in that same position, didn't know what it was about, and he got blown absolutely blown away by the eclipse and his reactions and his descriptions are beautiful he, he yeah. i've seen the tedx several times i know yeah. chris has too i've looped it you really owe it to yourself to see a total yeah. solar eclipse once you're yeah. once you're alive yeah. and you do Except and you do. I, you I think that's that's certainly one of the, one of the best quick and easy things for someone just to spend 10 minutes 15 minutes everybody's got a, a, a computer or a phone and access to the internet so they can watch that little video in 10 minutes and get an idea of what's going on. Yeah. Then, there, then there's stuff that. like uh, uh, the book that uh, the, the new edition of, of Totality that Mark Lippman and I um, just uh, uh, published last month mm. that oh, goes like into it. all kinds of details about the, the history of eclipses, uh, the mythology of eclipses, folklore, uh, stuff about how eclipses have, have been important to science. Uh uh, confirming Einstein's theory of, of relativity, uh, information on actually 
observing eclipses, information about photography. So that's sort of a go-to book for, for someone who's really starting to get interested in it now. I haven't gotten the new version. I'll have to go up, go get it then. I'll go get that new version. Thank yeah, you. it's got some more dedicated chapters on, on 2024. And it's got a nice look back chapter with photographs of 2017. Nice. Nice. Do you have a crazy eclipse story? Like what was your craziest eclipse where you thought, I, what the hell am I doing here? Yeah. Did you ever have something like I'll that? Give, I'll give you, I'll give you two. Okay. Um, what the hell am I doing here? That's happened a couple of times. Whenever the eclipse is less than 30 seconds, <laughs> you have to ask yourself, was it really worth it? All the hassle, all the expense going halfway around the world, uh, spending two weeks uh, for, for 25 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds uh, type of an eclipse. So that's happened several times. I mean, we went, to, the... we went to uh, East Africa in, uh, I think it was 2013, for a 12-second total eclipse. Wow. And not only were we clouded out, we were hit with a, a dust storm and a rainstorm. Mm -hmm. Wow. In the 20 minutes leading up to totality. Oh. So a peak of the crescent five minutes before totality, and then it went into the clouds. Oh. But on, on the plus side, we were in East Africa, and we were on safari, and we were seeing fantastic wildlife. Yeah. So it was a great trip. But the eclipse part of it didn't work out quite so well. Yeah. The well, other the other story, the other story I want to say is, Similar to your question, I'm often asked, what is my favorite solar eclipse? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and um, it's funny, I used to answer that, I, I'd answered that at, a, at a, a few talks, and my wife pointed out that I was incorrect. And I said, well, well what do you mean? She says, don't you really mean that the, your favorite eclipse is the one that we met at in India in 1995. So after that, I, I stand corrected, and now I'll always, always refer to 1995 as my favorite eclipse. Okay, that's cool. What was the one before that, before you had to change? Before that, when I was mistaken, yeah. it was 1991 <laughs> in Baja. <clears throat> it was a short eclipse, though. It was only 40, 42 seconds. But it had spectacular uh, Bailey's beads. Where was that? India or? That was in India. That was in yeah. India. Okay. That was another crazy eclipse halfway around the world. I know. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if I can sit on a plane that long in, anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm reading, reaching the breaking point. That I, I went to Australia last last yeah. uh, April, and, and that was that was killing me. Yeah. Uh. It was a long trip. We were it there was a long for, trip. We went there and it was going to be one minute and three seconds at our location. Yeah. And then we decided to change our location because it was easier to not be on the beach with all the crowds. And so it went down to 58 seconds. And then I was yeah. like, okay, it's under a minute. So now am I crazy? Or, you, you, know, start, yeah. you start adding a dollar. How many dollars per second? Yeah. Oh, let's not go there. Let us, <laughs> let us not go there at all. We do not want to go there at all. It was beautiful, yeah. though. It was perfect. It was. It was a wonderful it was, eclipse. It was. I, I, I've never seen one so pointy. It yeah. was the pointiest eclipse I had ever seen. Well, it's, it's uh, getting to, it's, it's a classic solar maximum type of a corona with lots of streamers. Please, please expand on that because I really want the audience to understand how amazing this one in 2024 will be. And also, are maximum. we getting, yeah, are we getting into solar maximum and have we peaked yet? We haven't peaked yet, and they, they never know exactly when it's going to peak. You know it's peaked in, 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 in um, the, after it's peaked. Okay. You can make estimates of when it's going to peak, but you don't really know it's peaked until you look at the data and say, yeah, it looks like the peak was three weeks ago or two months ago. But um, the whole idea with, with solar max is that the, the sun's magnetic field goes through an approximately 10 to 12 year cycle where it goes from high activity to low activity um, and then back again. And um, it, it averages out to 11 years. That's the 11 year sunspot cycle when you get 
lots of sunspots versus very few sunspots. And the a lot of activities on the sun are tied to this type of a uh, the cycle, including um, the corona surrounding the sun, because the corona is a is a, an electrically charged, magnetically charged plasma. So it's affected by the magnetic fields on the sun, and the magnetic fields on the sun are essentially sunspots or magnetic storms on the sun's surface. If you've got lots of sunspots, you've got lots of storms, you've got lots of magnetic fields changing, and that's pulling the corona all, all in all kinds of crazy directions. And you get all this interesting structure and streamers. So when you have uh, solar max, high magnetic activity on the sun, you get very interesting, uh, lots of detailed structure in the corona. It's The corona is bigger. It's usually a little brighter than it is at sunspot minimum. Uh, and there's usually a lot more structure. Sunspot minimum is a much quieter corona. It's sort of oval or football shaped. You see some polar brushes at the north and the south, but you don't, you don't usually see these enormous streamers going off in different directions. It's less pointy. <laughs> it's less pointy, very less pointy. Less pointy. I know. That's a, I'm a layman. Highly I'm a layman. Term. It's pointy. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, it was just, it was, for me, it, it was one of the most, it was the most amazing clips I saw because it was so short. So the moon was just very, you know, was not hiding as yeah. much as the corona. So you just saw this beautiful explosion of the streamers coming behind it. So I'm just And so it had excited. some great prominences as well. And chromosphere as well. Yeah. Oh, it was beautiful. So I'm really expecting lots of big things out of the 2024 because yes. it should be just that yeah. huge. Even though the but it's always cover, a surprise. Yeah, it's always a surprise. I did get the position to be the Kate North Texas coordinator for Kate. Oh, for Citizen Kate, great. Yeah, so for Citizen Kate, so I'll be doing. I'm, I'm sorry, well, co-coordinator. I am sharing the load with somebody else. That's great. But I'm just very proud, and I wanted to brag to you about it because I'm just yeah, so happy. Yeah, that, that's doing wonderful. It. Citizen yeah. Science. Citizen science. That was one of the big things in my book, my little itty bitty book compared to yours. Um, that was one of the things I was really impressed with because I was comparing the 1878 eclipse to this to where we are with eclipses today. And one of the things that really struck home with me, even then, how much citizen science went on. Yeah, they had, had people making sketches of the Coronans in, in exactly. 1878. People were coming by the hotel to. Um, I, I, did, I focused on the, the group that went to Fort Worth. And people were coming to the hotel to set their watches so they could give accurate time memberships, accurate time measurements back to the scientists there in Fort Worth. Wow. That's amazing. So it was just, I just love the citizen science evolved around all the eclipses. I've got a favorite story. I think it was maybe 1925. Was that the eclipse that went over Manhattan? Yes. Uh, and it was, a, they had students lined all the way up on the north and south sides of Broadway all the way up and the people on the south side of 96th Street did not see totality and the people on the north side of 96th right. do you have any can, can you elaborate on that story <clears throat> well they were trying to pin down exactly where the 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 edge of the eclipse path was mm -hmm. because they were still working out the finer details of, of the moon's orbit and um, yeah that was that was successful in trying to to help uh, pin it down. Uh, it's, that, it's kind of, in a sense, it's kind of cruel, though, because you you sentence some people to be outside the path yeah. of totality. When, for the average person, this is probably, the average guy, it is his once-in-a-lifetime chance to see a total eclipse. Well, that, ultimately, that work went into your, went into refining the calculations. Yeah, we, we've got much better, um, uh, theories for the motions of the sun and moon now so we don't need to do something like that yeah we do modeling now well i think we should let you go we, i really appreciate you doing this thank you very much for your time thank you very much oh, you're welcome okay clear sky okay. Clear, skies. clear skies yes yeah. <laughs> and don't forget Solar Eclipse glasses and Solar Eclipse viewers make great stocking stuffers, and they are the best Christmas present. Hope you enjoyed our chat with Mr. Eclipse. We certainly had a blast.
Next episode, we shift from the astrophysicist experience to the first-timer experience. Joining us from Perth, Western Australia, we have Alan Aldworth, host of the morning radio show, Hit WA. Alan traveled north from Perth to Exmouth to see his first total solar eclipse this last April. We love hearing eclipse virgins describe their first time. Always a pure take. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. It will help us improve the experience for you. Thank you for listening. And as always, clear skies. <laughs>